Welcome to Pride Arts. We are so excited to have you joining us for the Reignite series, our very first virtual season. This evening, we ask that you turn your cell phones up loud. You can text, call, visit pridearts.org and give a donation. You can even unwrap loud candies. But most importantly, we ask you to sit back and relax even more than you already are and enjoy tonight's performance of John Madison Morton's Bobville Classic Box and Cox. A room with closed curtains. Center is a bed and upstage a window. Three doors. A fireplace with ornaments on the mantelpiece. Tables and chairs. A chest of drawers. And a clock. Cox is looking at himself in a hand mirror. I'll never have my hair cut again. It looks as if I've just been cropped for the militia. And I was particularly emphatic in my instructions to the hairdresser. Only cut the ends. He must have thought I meant the other ends. Never mind. I shan't leave anybody to care about so early. He notices the clock. Eight o'clock. And I declare I haven't a moment to lose. Fate has placed me with the most punctual, particular, and preemptory of hatches. And I must fulfill my destiny. Open locks, whoever knocks. Mrs. Bouncer enters. Good morning, Mr. Cox. I hope you slept comfortably, Mr. Cox. I can't say that I did, Mrs. B. I should feel obliged to you if you could accommodate me with a better bolster, Mrs. B. The one I've got now seems to have about a handful and a half full of feathers at each end, and nothing of whatever in the middle. Anything to accommodate you, Mr. Cox. Thank you. 
then perhaps you'll be good enough to hold this glass. Oh, certainly. Oh, well, I do declare, Mr. Cox, you've had your hair cut. Cut? Hmm. Strikes me I've had it mowed. It's very kind of you to mention it, but I am sufficiently conscious of the absurdity of my personal appearance already. <laughs> now for my hat. That's the effect of having one's hair cut. This hat fitted me quite tight before. Luckily, I've got three more. This one's rather jolly. Never mind. Hmm. This one appears to wobble about it rather less than the others. <laughs> and now I'm off. Ooh, by the by, Mrs. Bouncer, I wish to call your attention to a fact that has been evident to me for some time past, and that is, that is that my coals go remarkably fast. Oh, Lord, Mr. Cox. It's not the case only with the coals, Mrs. Bouncer, but I've also lately observed a gradual and steady increase of evaporation among my candles, wood, sugar, and lucifer matches. Oh, Lord, Mr. Cox. I mean, surely you don't suspect me. I don't say I do, Mrs. B. I only you to understand that I don't believe it's the cat. I see. And is there anything else you'd like to grumble about? Grumble? <laughs> Mrs. Bouncer, do you possess such a thing as a dictionary? No, sir. Then I'll lend you one. And if you turn to the letter G, you'll find grumble, verb neuter, to complain without a cause. Now, that's not my case, Mrs. B. And now that we're upon the subject, I wish to know how is it that I frequently find my apartment full of smoke? Uh, well, I, uh, I suppose the chimney. The chimney doesn't smoke tobacco, Mrs. B. I'm speaking of tobacco smoke. Mrs. B, I really hope that you... Mrs. Bouncer, you are not guilty of cheroots or cubas? Indeed not, Mr. Cox. Or partial to a pipe? Oh, no, sir. Then how is it that I always... Oh, why, yes, yes, I suppose that must be it. What? What must be it? I haven't a distant particle of an idea what you mean. Oh, why, the gentleman who's got the addicts, sir, is hardly ever without a pipe in his mouth. And there he sits in front of the fireplace with his legs up on the mantelpiece. The mantelpiece? <laughs> that strikes me as a considerable stretch, either of your imagination, Mrs. B, or the gentleman's legs. I presume you mean the fender or the hob? Mm, sometimes one, sometimes the other. Anyway, there he sits for hours and just puffs away into the fireplace. Ah, so then you mean to say that this gentleman's smoke, instead of emulating the example of other sorts of smokes, are going up the chimney? Thinks proper to affect a singularity by taking a contrary direction? I beg your pardon. Then I suppose the gentleman that you are speaking of is the same individual that I invariably meet coming up the stairs when I'm going down and going down the stairs when I'm coming up. Why, oh, yeah! <laughs> From the appearance of his out manner, I should set him down to be the gentleman connected with the printing interest. Indeed, sir. Oh, and a very respectable young gentleman he is, sir. Mm. Well, good morning to you, Mrs. Bouncer. You'll be back at your usual time, I suppose, sir. Yes, nine o'clock. And you needn't light my fire in the future, Mrs. B. I shall do it myself. Oh, don't forget the bolster. And a half penny's worth of milk, Mrs. Bouncer. And kindly be good enough to let it stand. I wish for the cream to accumulate. <laughs> Well, he's gone at last. I declare I was all in a tremble for fear Mr. Box would come home before Mr. Cox went out. <laughs> Luckily, they never met yet. And what's more, they're not very likely to do so. How so? Well, Mr. Box is hard at work at a newspaper office all night long and doesn't come home until the morning. And Mr. Cox is busy making hats all day and doesn't come home until night. So you see, I'm getting double my money for my rent, and neither of my lodgers is any of the wiser for it. <laughs> but I haven't an instant to lose. First of all, let me move Mr. Cox's things out of Mr. Box's way. Now then, to place the key where Mr. Cox always finds it. <laughs> mm. Oh, <laughs> I must beg Mr. Box not to smoke so much. I was so dreadfully puzzled of what to say when Mr. Box brought it up. <laughs> okay, now then to make the bet. And don't let me forget 
What is the head of the bed for Mr. Cox becomes the foot of the bed for Mr. Box. People's tastes do differ so. <laughs> and the very idea of Mr. Cox to complain of such a fine bolster as this. She disappears behind the curtains. Off stage, we hear Box. Poo poo! Why do you keep to your own side of the staircase, sir? It was as much your fault as mine! I say, it was as much your fault as mine. Lord, Mr. Box, what is the matter? Mind your own business, Bouncer. Oh, dear, dear, Mr. Box. You are in quite a temper, to be sure. I declare, you are quite pale in the face. Well, what color would you have a man be? Who's been setting up long leaders for a daily paper all night? But then, you've all day to yourself. So it seems. Far be it from me, Bouncer, to hurry your movements, but... I think it right to acquaint you with my immediate intention of divesting myself of my garments and going to bed. Oh, Mr. Fox! It, not so fast. Can you inform me of the individual that I invariably encounter going down the stairs when I'm coming up and coming up the stairs when I'm going down? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, by the, uh, gentleman in the attic, sir. Uh, I meet him in all sorts of hats. Black hats, white hats, hats with broad brims, hats with narrow brims, hats with naps, hats without naps. I have come to the conclusion that he must individually and professionally be uh, uh, associated with the hatting interest. Yes, sir! <laughs> and, by the by, Mr. Box, he begged me to request of you, as a particular favor, that you would not smoke quite so much. Did he now? Huh. Well... Then you may tell the gentle hatter, with my compliments, that if he objects to the effluvia of tobacco, he better domesticate himself in some other parish. Oh, Mr. Box! Now surely you wouldn't deprive me of a lot. Well, it would, become, it would come to precisely the same thing, Bouncer. If I detect the slightest attempt to put my pipe out, I give you warning that I shall give you my warning at once. Very well, sir. <clears throat> and is there anything more you want of me? On the contrary. I've had quite enough of you. It's quite extraordinary the trouble I always have getting rid of that woman. She knows I'm up all night. Well, let me see. Should I take my nap before my breakfast or shall I take my breakfast before my nap? I think I have a rasher of bacon somewhere. I have the most distinct recollection of having purchased a rasher of bacon. He produces it, wrapped in paper, and places it on the table. <laughs> and a penny roll. Mm. The next thing is to light the fire. Oh, where are my whispers? <laughs> well, upon my life, this is too bad a bouncer this is. By several degrees, too bad. I'm perfectly aware she purloins my coals, and my candles, and my sugar, but I did think that my lucifers would be sacred. <laughs> he takes the candlestick off the mantelpiece, where there's a stump end of the candle. Huh. I'm only at home in the daytime, and I bought this on the 1st of May. Chimney Sweeper's Day? Calculating that it would last me at least three months, and here's one week not half over, and the candle is three parts gone! He lights the fire then takes down a gridiron. And Miss Bouncer has been using my gridiron! <laughs> the last article of consumption I cooked upon it was, was a pork chop, and now it is powerfully impregnated with the odor of red herring! <clears throat> he places the gridiron on the stove, and with the fork, adds the rasher of bacon. Well, how sleepy I am, to be sure. If only there was someone to superintend the turn of my bacon. But, <laughs> perhaps it will turn itself. I must lie down. He lies on the bed, closing the curtains around him. Cox enters in a hurry. Well, wonders will never cease. Conscious of being 11 minutes and a half behind time, I was sneaking into the shop in a state of considerable excitement when my vulnerable employer, with a state of extreme benevolence on his age countenance, said to me, Cox, I shan't want you today. You can have a holiday. Thoughts of Gravesend and back there. One shilling instantly suggested themselves, intermingled with the visions of Greenwich for fourpence. Then came the two penny omnibuses and the half penny boats. In short, <laughs> I am quite bewildered. However, I must have my breakfast first. That'll give me time to reflect. 
I bought a mutton chop, so I shan't want any dinner. Oh, goodness gracious, I forgot the bread. The hollow one. What's this? A roll, I declare. Come, come, that's lucky. Now then, to light the fire. Hello, hello. He notices the matches on the table. Who presumes to touch my box of lucifers? Why, it's empty! I left one in it, I know it! I took it out, I did. And why, the fire's lit. And where's the good iron? On the fire, I declare. And what's that on it? Bacon. Bacon it surely is. Well, now, upon my life, there's a quite coolness about Mrs. Bounce's proceedings that's almost amusing. She takes my lucifer, my coals, and my gridiron to cook her breakfast! No, no, I can't stand this. He pokes a fork into the bacon, then puts it on a plate on the table. Then he puts his chop on the gridiron, which he puts on the fire. Now then, my breakfast things. <sighs> Is that you, Mrs. Bouncer? Oh, come in, don't be afraid. I wonder how long I've been asleep. Goodness gracious, my bacon. Hello, hello. What's this, a chop? Who's chop? Mrs. Bouncer, I'll be bound. <laughs> the nurse, she thought to cook her breakfast while I was asleep with my coals and my gridiron, too. But where is my bacon? He sees it on the table. There it is. Well, upon my fire, Bouncer's certainly going it. But shall I curb my indignation? Shall I falter in my vengeance? No, I shall not. He digs the fork into the chop, opens the window, throws the chop out, and shuts the window again. <laughs> So much for Bouncer's breakfast, and now for my own. Puts the bacon on the gridiron again. <laughs> well, I might as well lay my breakfast things. Cox enters with a small tea, which he places on the drawers. Then suddenly, he recollects. Oh goodness, my chop! He goes to the stove. Hello, hello, what's this? Bacon again? Oh, ooh, this Confound it! Dash it! Damn it! I can't stand this! He pokes the fork into the bacon, opens the window, flings it out, shuts the window again, and returns to the drawers for his tea things. Then encounters Box coming from the cupboard with his tea things. They walk downstage together. And who are you, sir? Well, if it comes to that, who are you? What do you want here, sir? Well, if it comes to that, what do you want? It's the printer. It's the hatter. <gasps> Go to your attic, sir. My attic, sir. Your attic, sir. Printer, I shall do you a frightful injury if you do not instantly leave my apartment. Your apartment? I think you mean my apartment, you contemptible hatter. You. <laughs> your apartment? Ha! Your apartment? I like that. <laughs> Look here, sir. He takes a receipt out of his pocket. Mrs. Bounce's receipt for last week's rent, sir. Box also takes out a receipt and waves it all up in Cox's face. Ditto, sir. Mrs. Mrs. Bouncer! Mrs. Mrs. Bouncer! What's the matter? Oh. I demand you instantly remove that hat. And I demand you immediately turn out that printer. Well, uh, but gentlemen, explain. Explain whose room this is. Yes, whose room is this? Does it not belong to me? No. No, no there. You hear it, sir? It belongs to me. No, 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 no. It belongs to both of you. Both, both of us. Oh, dear gentlemen. Okay, don't be angry with me. Well, with this gentleman working all night and that gentleman during the day, I figured I might venture until my little second back floor room was ready. When will your little back second floor room be ready? Tomorrow. I'll take it. So will I. Excuse me. But if you both take it, you may as well just stay where you are. True. True. I spoke first, sir. Well, with all my heart, sir, the little back second floor room is yours. Now go! Go! Okay, now don't borrow, gentlemen. You see, there used to be a little partition right here. And then put, put it back up. No, I'll see if I can get that little back second floor room ready this very day. Now, do keep your tempers. Cox paces the room. What a disgusting position. Box sits at one side of the table, his eyes watching Cox's erratic movements. It's... Will you allow me to observe, sir, that if you have not had any exercise today, you might as well go out and take it. 
I shall not do anything of the sort, sir. Cox sits at the table opposite Box. Very well, sir. Very well indeed, sir. However, don't allow me to prevent you from going out. Don't flatter yourself, sir. Cox is about to eat the roll. Uh, that's my roll, sir! Cox snatches it away and puts a pipe to his mouth. Hollowbot, what are you about, sir? What am I about? I'm about to smoke. Ugh. Cox opens the window. Put that window down, sir. Then you put out your pipe, sir. There. There. Cox returns to his seat. I shall retire to my pillow. Box goes to the bed where he sits. Cox jumps up, goes to the bed, and lays down. I beg your pardon, sir. I cannot allow anyone to rumble my bed. Your bed, hark ye, sir. Can you fight? No, sir. Oh, no, no. Come on. Sit down, sir. I shall instantly vociferate, please. Box sits. So does Cox. Well, sir, although we are doomed to occupy the same room for a few hours longer, I don't see any necessity for our cutting each other's throats. Not at all. It's an operation that I should decidedly object to. And, after all, I have no violent animosity towards you, sir. And I, nor have I no any rooted antipathy towards you, sir. Mm. Besides, it was all Mrs. Bouncer's fault, sir. Entirely, sir. Very well, sir. Very well, sir. Mm -hmm. Take a bit of roll, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Do you sing, sir? I sometimes do it in a chorus. <laughs> then give us a chorus. You heard of the Bozeman, sir. No, sir. My wife wouldn't let me. Your wife? Uh, that is my uh, intended. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the same thing. Uh, uh, I congratulate you. They shake hands. Thank you. You needn't disturb yourself, sir. She won't come here. Oh, I see. <laughs> You've got a snug little establishment of your own here, on the slide. Cut it up. <laughs> no such thing, sir. I repeat, no such thing, sir. But my wife, I, I mean my intended wife, happens to be the proprietor of a considerable number of bathing machines. Bathing machines? Uh, <laughs> but where? At a favorite watering place. In the bathing season, we see a little bit of each other. But as that is now over, I am daily indulging in the expectation of, of being blessed with the sight of my beloved. Are you married? Uh, me? <coughs> uh, not exactly. Oh, happy bachelor. Uh, why not uh, precisely? Uh, oh, a <laughs> widower then? Uh, no, uh, not. Absolutely, it's more of You'll excuse uh, me, sir, but at present I don't exactly understand how you can help being at least one of three. Well, not help it. It's, uh... No, sir, not you, or any other man alive. Uh, that may be, but, uh, uh I lie. <laughs> You'll excuse me, sir, but I don't like joking upon such subjects. I am perfectly serious, sir. I've been defunct for the last three years. Will you be quiet, sir? Uh, if you don't believe me, I'll refer you to a very large, numerous, and respectable circle of disconsolate friends. My dear sir. <laughs> my, my very dear sir. If there does exist some ingenious contrivance whereby a man on the eve of committing matrimony can leave this world and yet stop in it, I shouldn't be sorry to know it. Oh, <laughs> then I presume I'm not to set you down as being frantically attached to your intended. Why, not exactly. <laughs> and yet, at present, I'm only aware of one obstacle to doting upon her, and that is 
I can't abide that. <laughs> then there's nothing more easy. Do as I did. Oh, I will. What was that? Drown yourself. Drown myself? Did you be quiet, sir? Listen to me. Three years ago, it was my misfortune to captivate the affections of a still-blooming, though somewhat middle-aged widow at Ramsgate. Singular enough. Just my case three months ago at Margate. Well, sir, to escape her importunities, I came to the determination of enlisting in the blues or the lifeguards. So did I. How very odd. But they wouldn't have me. They actually had the effrontery to say I was too short. And I wasn't tall enough. So I was obliged to content myself with the marching regiment. I enlisted. So did I. Singular coincidence. I had no sooner done so than I was sorry for it. So was I. My infatuated widow offered to purchase my discharge on condition that I led her to the altar. Just my case. I hesitated, but I did consent. I consented at once. Well, sir, the day fixed for the happy ceremony at length drew near. In fact, too near to be pleasant, so I suddenly discovered that I wasn't worthy to possess her. And I told her so, and instead of being flattered by the compliment, she flew upon me like a tiger. As I retreated, suddenly something whizzed past me within an inch of my ear and shivered into a thousand fragments against the mantelpiece. It was the slop basin. I retaliated with a teacup. Consequently, we parted, and the next morning I was served with a notice of action for breach of promise. Well, sir. Well, sir. Ruin stared me in the face. The action proceeded against me with gigantic strides. I took a desperate resolution. I left my home early one morning with a snit of clothes on my back and another tied up in a bundle under my arm. I arrived at the cliffs, opened the bundle and deposited the suit of clothes on the very verge of the precipice. I took one look at the yawning gulf beneath me and walked off in the other direction. <laughs> Do you hear me? I think I could give them some slight perception of your meaning. Mm. Ingenious creature. You disappeared. And the suit of clothes were found. Exactly. And in one of the pockets of the coat or the waistcoat of the pantalons, I forget which, was a piece of paper with these affecting farewell words. This is thy work. Oh, Penelope Air! Penelope Air! Penelope Ann. Penelope Ann. Originally widow of William Wiggins. Widow of William Wiggins. Proprietor of bathing machines. Proprietor of bathing machines at Margate. At Ramsgate. <laughs> it must be she. And you, sir. You are Bucks. <laughs> the lamented, <laughs> long lost Bucks. I am. I was about to marry the interesting creature you so cruelly deceived. No, then you are Cops. I am. <laughs> Oh, um, I, I congratulate you, sir. I, I, I give you joy, but um, I think I'll go against all. As he leaves. No, you don't. Stopping him. <laughs> I'll not lose sight of you until you are restored to the arms of your intended. <laughs> my intended? You mean your intended? No, sir. Yours. How can she be my intended now that I'm grand? You're no such thing, sir. <laughs> I, I prefer presenting you to Penelope. Yes. Oh, I have no wish to be introduced to your intended. My intended? How can that be, sir? You proposed to her first. Oh, what of that, sir? I came to an untimely end, and you thought the question had to words. Very well, sir. Very well, sir. You are much more worthy of her than I am, sir. Permit me, then, to follow the generous impulse of my nature. Thank you, Father Chief. Oh, benevolent being! Oh, I would rob you of the world. Good morning, sir. Seizing him. Hey, unhand me, Hatter! I shall cast off the lamp and assume the lions. Snapping his fingers all up in Box's face. Ooh, no. An insult to my very face under my very nose? Well, you know the consequences, sir. Instant satisfaction, sir. With all my heart, sir. <sighs> Mrs. Mrs. Bouncer! Mrs. Mrs. Bouncer! What is it, gentlemen? Pistols for two! Oh, yes, sir. Stop! You don't mean to say that you keep loaded firearms in the house? Oh, no, sir. <laughs> They're not loaded. Oh, then use the murder weapons instantly. I say, sir. Well, sir. What's your opinion of dueling, sir? I think it's a barbarous practice, sir. Mm, so do I, sir. To be sure, I don't as much object to it when the pistols are not loaded. No. I do say that does make some difference. And yet, sir, on the other hand, doesn't it strike you as rather a waste of time for two people to keep firing pistols at each other with nothing in them? <laughs> no, sir. Not more than any other harmless recreation. Mm. So why do you object to marrying Penelope Ann? 
Because, as I've observed already, I can't abide her. You'll be very happy with her. Happy? Me? Uh, with the consciousness that I've deprived you of such a treasure. No, no, Fox. <laughs> Don't think of me, Fox. I shall sufficiently be rewarded by the knowledge of my Fox's happiness. Don't be absurd. Then you don't be ridiculous. I won't have her. I won't have her. I have it. Suppose we draw lots for the lady, huh, Mr. Cox? That's fair enough, Mr. Fox. Mm. Or, what do you say to dice? With all my heart. Mm. Dice by all means. That's lucky. Mrs. Boucher's nephew left a pair here yesterday. He sometimes persuades me to have a throw for a trifle, and he always throws sixes. I suspect they're good ones. I have no objection to dice at all. I lost one pound, seventeen and sixpence at last Barnett's races to a very gentlemanly looking man who had a most peculiar knack of throwing sixes. I suspected they were loaded, so I gave him another half crown and he gave me the dice. Hmm. Now then, sir. I'm ready, sir. Oh. Will you lead off, sir? Well, as you please, sir. The lowest throw, of course, wins from Of course, sir. Very well, sir. Well, Rattling dice and throwing. Sixes! Well, it's not a bad throw of yours, sir. Rattling dice throws. Sixes! It's a pretty good throw of yours, sir. Sixes! 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 Those are not bad dice of yours, sir. Those would be pretty good ones, too, sir. Suppose we change. They swap dice. Sixes! Sixes. 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 Now, pooh! It is perfectly absurd you going on throwing sixes in that sort of way. I shall go on until my luck changes, sir. Well, let's try something else. I have it. Suppose we, we um, toss for Penelope again. Very same thing I was going to propose. Hmm. Where is my tossing machine? Ah. There it is. Hmm. Penelope sixpence. Got it. Now then, sir. Heads to win. Or tails to lose, whichever you prefer. It's the same as you need, sir. Very well, sir. Heads I win, tails you lose. Yes. No! <laughs> Heads to win. There you go. Go on. Heads. 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 You're rather tired of turning up heads, sir. Could you bury the knock me off the seat with my occasional tail? So. Tossing Cox's six pence. Hello, hello! Your coin has no tail, sir. <laughs> and your shilling has two heads, sir. Cheat! Swindler! Is, Is the, the little back second floor room ready? Not quite, gentlemen. I can't find the pistols, but I have brought you a letter. It came yesterday. I'm sure I don't know how I forgot it, for I kept it carefully in my pocket. And you've kept it carefully in your pocket ever since. Yes, sir. I do hope you'll forgive me, sir. Margate. Postmark decidedly says Margate. That was the tender epistle from Penelope Air. Handing letter to Box. Then read it, sir. Me, sir? Of course. You don't suppose I'm going to read a letter from your intended? My intended? Pooh, it's addressed to you. C-O-S. Do you think that's a C? It looks more to me like a bee. Uh, nonsense. Open it. Oh. Opens letter. Goodness gracious. Snatching letter. Uh, goodness gracious. Snatching letter again. Oh. Margate, May the 4th. Sir, I hasten to convey you to the intelligence of a melancholy accident which has bereft you of your intended wife. He means your intended. Uh, no, yours. She was unquestionably yours. How can that be? You proposed to her first. Yes, but then you could. Oh, get, oh, stop. Let's not do that again. Go on, go on. Poor Mrs. Wiggins went for a short excursion in a sailing boat. A sudden and violent squall soon after took place, which it is supposed upset her, as she was found two days afterwards, two upwards. Poor woman. Not the woman, sir, the boat. As her man of business, I immediately proceeded to examine her papers, amongst which I soon discovered her will. The following extract, from which will, I have no doubt, be satisfactory to you. 
I hereby bequeath my entire property to my intended husband. Oh, excellent. What unhappy creature. No generous, ill-fated being. Oh, and to think I toss a coin for such a woman. And I staked such a treasure on the hazard of a die. Oh, I'm sure, Mr. Box, I can't sufficiently thank you enough for your sympathy. Well, then I'm sure, Mr. Cox, that you couldn't feel more if she had been your own intended. If she'd been my own intended? She was my own intended. <laughs> and your intended, come on like that. Didn't you very properly observe just now, sir, that I, I proposed to her first? Uh, to which you very sensibly replied that you had come to an untimely end. I deny it. So I say you have. The fortune's mine. Mine. I'll have it. So what? I shall go to the law. So what? No, stop. A thought strikes me. Instead of going to the law about the property, suppose we divide it. Equally. Equally, I'll take two-thirds. Fair enough. I'll take three-fourths. That bad won't do. Half and half. <sighs> Agreed. There's my hand upon it. And mine. Hello, hello, postman again? Postman yesterday, postman today. Enter Mrs. Bouncer. Another letter, Mr. Cox. Another trifle from Margate. Opens it. Goodness gracious. Snatching letter. Goodness gracious. Snatching letter again. I'm happy to inform you. False alarm. Overlooking. Sudden squall. Boat upset. Mrs. Wiggins, your intended. Picked up by a steamboat. Carried to Bologna. Returned here this morning. We'll start by early train tomorrow. And be with you at ten o'clock exact. I give you joy. Oh, no, well, I'm sorry. The, the, the most important business of the, the, the co colonial office will prevent my witnessing the truly happy meeting between you and your intended. Good morning, sir. Ah, ah, it's obviously for me to retire. Not for the world, but I disturb the rapturous meeting between you and your intended. Good morning, sir. Uh, you'll excuse me, sir, but our last arrangement was that she was your intended. No, yours. Yours? <laughs> Yours! Ten o'clock strikes, and then the sound of an approaching omnibus. What's that? A cab is drawn up at the door. But, no, it's a two-penny omnibus. Leaning over Box's shoulder. No, the lady's got out. There's no mistaking that majestic person. It's Penelope Ann. Your intended. Yours. Yours! Both run to the door, eagerly listening. She's coming up the stairs. They slam the door. Both of them lean up against it with their backs. Mr. Cox, Mr. Cox. I've stepped out, oh, so have I. Mr. Cox. She pushes at the door. Box and Cox redouble their efforts to keep the door shut. Open the door, it's only me. Miss Bouncer. Only you? Then where's the lady? Gone. Upon your honor, as a gentleman. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, and she's left a note for Mr. Cox. Give it to me, then open the door. Put it under. Ugh. The letter is put under the door. Cox picks it up and opens it. Goodness gracious. Snatching letter. Goodness gracious. Snatching the letter back. Dear Mr. Cox, Pardon my candor. Overlooking. Convinced that our feelings, like our ages, do not reciprocate, I hasten to apprise you of my immediate union with Mr. Knox! What's up? Three cheers for Knox! <laughs> <laughs> the little second back room is quite ready now. I don't want it. No more do I. <laughs> what shall part us? What shall tear us asunder? Fox. Cox. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. You'll excuse the apparent insanity of the remark, but the more I gaze upon your features, the 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 more I'm convinced that you're my the long lost 
brother? <laughs> Very observation I was going to make of you. Ah, ah, then tell me, do you have a, such a thing as a strawberry mark on your left arm? No. No. Then it is he! <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, of course, Mr. Uh, we are. Of, of course. Um, <laughs> between uh, you and me, I'm rather partial to this house. Ah, uh, so am I. Um, I've begun to feel quite at home. <laughs> Everything is so clean and comfortable. Well, and, and I'm sure the mistress of it, from what I've seen of her, is very anxious to please. So she is. I vote, Box, that we stick by her. Uh, agreed. There's my hand upon it. Join the doors and agree that the house is big enough to hold both of us. Then Box and Cox are satisfied. Fade to black.